Okay, welcome back. Before you look at this video, you should have looked at the basic energy concepts video and also the fermentation video. And we're going to pick up from there. After you use glycolysis as described in the fermentation video, the end product of that is pyruvate. Now in the fermentation video, we talked about how pyruvate is then reduced in fermentation to give very different products. In respiration, pyruvate is taken and completely oxidized. And in the process, the high energy electrons are extracted from it. The first step of that is the formation of acetyl-CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It basically takes pyruvate and coenzyme A, which is an organic molecule that is used in some enzymes. It puts them together to form acetyl coenzyme A, CO2, and extracts a couple of high energy electrons in the form of NADH. This is then plugged into the TCA cycle, and you've probably seen this before if you've looked at metabolism in any kind of biology class. And the TCA cycle is incredibly common. It's in our mitochondria, but lots of other organisms use it too. So the acetyl-CoA up here is combined with oxaloacetate and then brought through this entire cycle and in the process completely oxidized. So when acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate combine, you get citrate formed in the first part of the six carbon phase. The citrate is converted through a few isomerizations and then oxidized. Isocitrate is oxidized in the process, NADH is formed, and one CO2 is released, and this is oxidized to alpha ketoglutarate to go into the five carbon phase, and then another oxidation takes place, removing more electrons in the form of NADH, and then succinyl-CoA is made. In the next step, succinyl-CoA is converted into succinate, and in the process, the substrate level phosphorylation occurs where GDP is formed in GTP. You get another electron is extracted in FAD, and then the fumarate is converted back to oxaloacetate to complete the cycle. The results of the TCA cycle, you get four NADH and one FADH, and these serve as sources of electrons for the electron transport chain. These are very high energy electrons. If you go back and you look at that electron potential tower that we showed you, you'll see that NADH is very high in the tower, has a lot of energy. You get one GTP from substrate level phosphorylation, and then the intermediates of the TCA are also used in biosynthetic pathways. So they will be the starting point for making all sorts of things in the cell. The key for the TCA cycle is to develop pyruvate. And we talked about one way to get pyruvate, which is through glycolysis, and that's the breakdown of sugar. It's not the only nutrient that can be broken down to generate pyruvate. Another example is the catabolism of fats, and we're going to look at lipid catabolism. If you're going to catabolize lipids, the first thing that you have to do is you have to break apart the lipid, and it's broken apart into the glycerol backbone, the hydrophilic group, and the two fatty acids, and this is carried out by various phospholipases. The hydrophilic group is degraded by various ways we aren't going to go into, the glycerol backbone is plugged into glycolysis at the three carbon phase and converted into pyruvate. And the fatty acids are degraded by something called beta oxidation. So let's look at that. In beta oxidation, you have this alpha carbon next to the carbonyl group here and this beta carbon. And in beta oxidation, this beta carbon is oxidized. So the first thing you do in the step is you add CoA to it and make this CoA molecule with the fatty acid hanging off of it. You then start to oxidize this beta carbon. The first thing you do is you extract some electrons in, the, in FADH. You now have a double bond here. You hydrolyze, you add water to that double bond, make an OH. You then extract more electrons into NADH and you now you've oxidized this beta carbon to a carbonyl group. This carbonyl group in the beta position is now open for attack. An enzyme comes in, binds this molecule, and reacts it with CoA, splitting off an acetyl-CoA and leaving this fatty acid molecule two carbons shorter. So if this began as a 16 carbon fatty acid, it's now 14. And by going through seven more turns of the cycle, you can convert 
all of this into acetyl-CoA. Now, some points from fat catabolism. First of all, there's the reuse of components. Whenever possible, the cell is going to reuse a carrier cofactor or enzyme. In this example we just went through of beta-oxidation, coenzyme A plays a major role, and electron carriers FAD and NAD are used. Second is a concept I like to call funneling. The cell will always try to reuse pathways it already has. So a given substrate will be converted into a common metabolite and then funneled into an already existing pathway. For example, fatty acids are broken down into acetyl-CoA, and this is then fed into the TCA cycle. You'll also notice that you get a lot of electrons of FAD and NADH for every fat. Fats have a lot of energy in them. Right? So now we have all these high energy electrons that we can get from breaking down other stuff. And what we really need is we need some reduced electrons for cell synthesis, but we also need a lot more ATP. And how do we get that ATP? Well, what chemotrophs do that grow by respiration is they have electron transport systems. They run this oxidation and they, they take these, these high-energy electrons, they run them through the electron transport system, it makes a membrane electrochemical gradient, and then this is used to synthesize ATP. The, this chemical energy stored as ATP is then used in movement, transport, biosynthesis. But the electrochemical gradient can sometimes also be used in movement and transport. So it does all sorts of different things. Let's look at how this all fits together. Another critical point here is there are electron carriers and these carriers are found in enzymes and they often contain iron sulfur clusters and here's two types of iron sulfur clusters. You have a peptide chain and these iron sulfur proteins then will hold these electrons on these irons in these iron sulfur clusters. Another type of electron carrier are cytochromes and these cytochromes are proteins that contain hemes and here's a heme right here. It has what's called this porphyrin ring and then you have an iron in the middle and it can carry one electron. Here is the structure of cytochrome C. Now, in the electron transport chain, what you do is NADH comes in and the two electrons and two protons are donated to FMN and then the electrons go through these series of electron carriers and eventually the electrons end up on oxygen and reduce it to water. And this is why we actually require oxygen. And if you look at the electron potential of the carriers, you'll see that they all line up. And these are all favorable reactions because the potential energy, the electron potential of the highest energy of carriers, NAD, is higher than the next one in the series flavoprotein and iron sulfur proteins than quinones. So it, you go bouncing down this cascade and eventually the electrons end up on oxygen. You'll notice that if you know the electron potentials of all the different things, the proteins that you think are involved in the electron transport chain, you can pretty much make a very good educated guess of how they all line up. You also notice in this process of moving electrons through these different complexes, the work that's done is to move protons across the membrane and you ge generate this electrochemical gradient. It's like charging a battery across the membrane. All right, so let's look at oxidative phosphorylation. This is also called electron transport level phosphorylation. You have, again, a series of electron carriers in the membrane and the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. And here's another look at how that system fits, to get, fits together. So, some general thoughts about electron transport. The membrane serves two functions. Number one, it separates the charge. Protons cannot penetrate this membrane. Second, it holds the respiration component. Now, there's two questions that we're going to answer about respiration that really get into the details of how it actually works, how it creates this gradient of protons. Number one, how are high energy electron carriers converted to protein pond separation? And number two, how is this proton separation converted to ATP?
we're going to look at two mechanisms for generating this proton gradient from high energy electrons. The key here is the spatial arrangement of electron carriers in the membrane and their ability to accept protons and electrons and where the carrier is in the membrane. Right. So for the first one here, this is the NADH dehydrogenase complex. And what it does is the electrons are donated to this NADH dehydrogenase complex. And you'll notice that the first electron carrier takes two electrons and then transfers them to quinone. And in the process, it pumps protons across the membrane. These are then donated to the quinone pool. So then you get all these quinones and they go over to the cytochrome B C1 complex. Here's where we can really look at the mechanism in the cytochrome B C1 complex. In this, the quinone gets reduced and its electrons are from the NH iron protein and the protons are from the cytoplasm. It then donates them to cytochrome B C1 complex and in the process, more protons are moved across the membrane. So let's look at how this mechanism works. Here is a little animation of this. Here's the electron representation. Here's a proton. Here's a quinone. Here's a cytochrome BC1 complex. Okay. The quinone comes in. It's at the, it donates its electrons near the outside of the membrane. This iron sulfur center is only willing to accept the electrons, so the proton is released, and since it's near the outside of the membrane, it moves to the outside. The electron then goes through a number of electron carriers, comes down to the cytochrome, and then an interesting thing happens. Is that it donates its electron back to the quinone. The electron potentials are, are close enough that this can actually happen. The second one comes in, a proton gets pumped here, a proton gets pumped here, and you end up with two turns of the cycle of pumping four protons across the membrane and regenerating one quinone that can be used again. Okay, one final thing I want to mention is that these electrons, when they go through this complex, you saw them exit to the left. And what actually happens to them is they actually then get donated to cytochrome C and head on over to the next complex. And you can see them exiting here over to the left. That's one mechanism. And what happens is protons get pumped across the membrane. Okay, a second mechanism is the cytochrome oxidase complex. Electrons come from cytochrome C1, where they were left off in our little video. Eventually, they reduce O2 forming water, and the exact mechanism is unclear, but it involves a conformational change of the protein, and let's look at that one. All right, so electron protons, cytochrome C, cytochrome oxidase. Okay, in this case, they're coming from the BC1 complex being carried by cytochrome C. Cytochrome C adds one electron at a time. The electron comes in and goes to this copper molecule right here. Once you have two electrons, oxygen will bind. Another electron comes in. And if we stop right here, you can see that the electron comes in. It generates water. Right? So two protons come in from the cytoplasm and form water. Another pro two protons, when this reaction takes place, a gate in the molecule is open and they pump two more protons across the membrane. Okay, another electron comes in after that pumping. And again, when we get to this point, right, water is formed, two more protons get made. That shows you how these enzymes using the transfer of electrons, end up pumping protons across the membrane. It has to do with spatial arrangements and conformational changes that can involve opening gates and pumping protons. That is not the only respiratory pathway. There are many different organic and inorganic compounds that can be electron donors for respiration, and then they will end up generating high energy electrons that can be used in electron transport chains. There are thousands of organic chemicals that can serve in this process. In lithotrophs, there's ammonia, hydrogen, methane, sulfur, iron, and many different inorganic molecules that can serve as electron donors. The electron acceptors can vary too. Aerobic respiration 
the one you're probably most familiar with from your biology classes, uses oxygen. But microorganisms can do all sorts of other terminal electron acceptors, and this is all collectively called anaerobic respiration. It can use nitrate, sulfate, iron, and other oxidized metals, carbon dioxide, organic compounds including aromatic and halogenated compounds. So there's all sorts of things that can serve as terminal electron acceptors that have been found in microorganisms. We've generated this proton gradient and that proton gradient can be used to do work. For instance, it can be used to help transport molecules across the membrane. It's also used for motility. It helps rotate the flagella. However, you also need chemical energy in the form of ATP and a enzyme in the membrane, ATP synthase, can convert that proton gradient into ATP. There's two components. There's this F0 motor and it's like at the top here and it's like a water wheel. It turns around and then the F1 which is the ATP synthase. There is this really nice video on YouTube to watch and I'm going to provide a link to that and then you can go click on that link and watch the video. Once you're done, come back to this one. As you can see, that is really cool and this is how these protons are converted into ATP. All right, so just to summarize so far what we've talked about in metabolism, organic compounds by chemoheteroorganotrophs can be converted into various things, right, to, into acetyl-CoA, and this can then use, be used to make electron transport or proton motive force. And you can have all sorts of different electron acceptors, including oxygen. ATP is formed, you still have reduced electrons, in the form of NADH, not all of them are used in the electron transport system, and these can be used for biosynthesis. Organic compounds can also be used for fermentation. And again, remember that in fermentation, ATP is generated only by substrate level phosphorylation, and NADH is generated by the oxidation of the organic compounds. Now, in chemolithotrophy, you take inorganic compounds as your source of electrons. You move those through electron transport and make a proton motive force. And again, you can have all sorts of term electron acceptors, sulfur, nitrate, sulfate, oxygen. You generate ATP, and then ATP and NADH are used for biosynthesis. But you get all your carbon by taking CO2 and making organic molecules, and then this is used for biosynthesis. So chemolithotrophs will almost always be autotrophs. Okay, that is it for this presentation. See you next time when we talk about photosynthesis.